Well, good morning. It's nice to have everyone here this morning in our finally uh, warmer days. I know the nights have been back to the wintry type of uh, season with us, but it is nice to uh, have that sunshine. I want to think, of, uh, if you will, with me about this uh, story I heard about a knot hole in the wall. I talked some already and they had a different concept and I said, no, there's another thinking on this. And I want us to think about this little story of a preacher who would secretly roll up his sermon notes for his sermon and slip it in the knot hole in the wall. And then when he would get up to preach his sermon, he would kind of back up against the wall there and grab his notes out and pull them out and none was the wiser. I, I cheat a little bit in the sense that I don't have notes, but I have a tablet that I have uh, this PowerPoint and my notes on. But I can assure you that if technology fails, I'll be able to get through this. And that's what we have to think about there. Um, anytime we prepare for God's word, we have to do it in the sense that we know what we're talking about and into God's uh, depth of what his teaching is. So the preacher goes on to say when he backed up against that wall and he felt that his note was not in that knot hole, but rather it fell in the hole, he was shocked, as you can imagine. Maybe like some of you, maybe panicked. There goes your little cheat sheet. So he turned to the congregation. He said, well, you know, folks, you see this knot hole in the wall here? Uh, behind that knot hole and in the wall, there's a good sermon, if we could just get it out. So that's what we're hoping today, is to get a sermon out of that knot hole today, and we're going to try and do that. Uh, Judges chapter 7, Judges chapter 7 is where the majority of our, our base text is coming from. And the title of this slide is, I Don't Need Anybody's Help. Sometimes we can get that way as we're going through our Bible uh, class and the book of Joshua and God's people, once they get so confident of overtaking, never losing a man, they get pretty cocky in the sense that, hey, you know, it's on us. The power's within us. But we have to be careful that we don't have God's power uh, and we think that we're doing it all by ourselves when it's truly the work of God. He set it in motion a long time ago before you and I was even thought of. <clears throat> Judges chapter 7 and verse 1, Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah. In the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. That word vaunt there in the Hebrew is 6286. 6286 means to embellish or boast. We're warned of that. Just like these people were warned here. Uh, we try and do it God's way, right? Uh, and we have a very early biblical example of a group of people <clears throat> trying to do it on their own way. In Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven or unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. Their duty, their goal, their purpose was, hey, 
Let's do it on our own. Make our own self a name. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You get a bunch of like-minded people together in the sense that it's all common. You want to create mischief, uh, turmoil, that sort of thing. You feed off from each other. Well, hey, if we do this, maybe we can get a little bit more here. We can rob these people. I know they're rich. We've got this, and so on and so forth. But if we could turn that around biblically, you get a bunch of months of the same like-minded people that Paul warned be of the same mind, same judgment. We're going to touch on that here in a minute. We can feed off from that and doing better and better and better for the work of the Lord each and every day. But continuing on, verse 7 now. Go to, let us go down there and confound their language. That word confound is 1101 in the Hebrew, 1101 which means to mix, mix up their language. This is where we get all the different languages today that is on this earth. Their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel or Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them upon the face of the earth. Then we get into people can change the way that their mind goes, their, their mouths. People can actually condition themselves to lie. They live a false reality in the sense that everything that they say is a lie coming out of their mm -hmm. mouth. Hopefully that is never said of you listening or you that's in this congregation today. Jeremiah 9 verse 5. Jeremiah 9 verse 5. And they will deceive everyone as neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Iniquity is sin. They trouble themselves to get into sinful things. Sometimes they may not realize what they're doing is sinful. Hence, therefore, we, with the Bible, being Christians, have to help those people that may be in these lives of sin. Because don't forget, we ourselves once lived in a life of sin, and somebody took that time out for us to help us. <clears throat> but I want us to consider Proverbs chapter 6, 16 through 19, that six things the Lord doth hate, yea, seven is an abomination unto him. And that was verse 16, verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, in heart that despises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to in running, or swift in running to mischief, false witnesses that speak lies, and he that soweth discord among his brethren. God hates that. Hate's a strong word today. <clears throat> hate in the sense that God hates it. He's the creator of hate, he's the creator of love. Hate is what the things that he hates is going to cost you your soul one day. If you continue to live in these things or dabble in these things, you will lose your soul to that. Cannot be left up to man to devise his own ways. Remember the Tower of Babel, Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That death is a separation from God. Just a little side note here. People say, well, the Bible was written by man. Really today, do you think about 4,000 different men from uh, over a period of years could write a Bible and have it go hand in hand and not contradict itself? 
Every four mm -hmm. years, don't we have a, a, a leader of this great country, the United States, and they change the ways? Denominations, they'll have different things that come up where they elect certain leaders by whatever way it is. They change it to the way they want to do it, but God's word, he said, will never change. You find a contradiction, you have to be careful. And now these modern versions and translations, they take away from what the original was. They're condoning sin now because it's easier to sell those Bibles than this old one here that's, I can't understand. I challenge you to get into it. If you want to have a Bible study on can't understand certain things, please reach out. I would take the time out of my day to help you to study God's word. God expects man though, when he is speaking in his word, this word of God, to speak the same thing. First Corinthians chapter one and verse 10, Paul said to the church there, now I beseech you brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and there be no, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There should be no religious divisions this day. So if there is, is not that a contradiction of what Paul told the early church? The church that Christ said he would start in Matthew 16, 18. Whose name should be on that church? Who died for the church? Jesus. Jesus Christ did. His name belongs on that church. Any other name shows that glory and honor going to that individual or whatever it may, mode of commandment or whatever is on there. It is not glorifying God. That should be a flag to you this day. We talked about free pass this morning, didn't we? Everybody wants a free pass. Get you into the fair, get you a big old fat elephant ear so you can eat that or a big old wad of cotton candy. Ooh, that'd be so yummy, wouldn't it? To some people. But that free pass we're going to find out here, it's not very often that God gives his people a free pass to sit back. And Judges continuing on now in chapter 7 and verse 3, now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remain 10,000. There was 32,000 people there that day, and 22 of that 32,000 split. More than half was afraid. Are we afraid today to stand up for the gospel? Are we afraid to teach people the gospel? God's not giving us a free pass on that. So now there's 10,000 people that remained, and I want you to think about that. There's a point here. As we continue reading on now, in verses 4 through 6, less than one percent God's going to use to get his work done glorifying God and God alone and the Lord said unto Gideon the people are yet too many bring them down unto the water and I will try them for thee there that word try them or try them is 6884 means to refine or to purge away God's going to tighten it up a little bit. And like we said this morning about sending the best of the best out to do the work, God's going to get the best of the best here. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, and the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth himself shall thou set by himself. 
Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men, but all the rest of the people bowed down to their knees to drink water. That left 9,700 people that got excluded. But they all drank of the same water, didn't they? Today we can use that. And, well, everybody preaches the Bible. No. They may preach the Bible, but it's not in the entirety of God and keeping it all the same mind, same judgment, let there be no division among you. God said, I want these people that lap up the water. They get down, they use their hand to put the water in their mouth. He set a bar for those people to try them, to sift them out. If you do the percentage, it's 0 .009, just under 1%. God's going to make an example here to show that it's not might and strength that's not in the people, but it's in the power of God. As the world gets bigger, Christians are going to look a lot smaller in this world, especially with today's day and age of the things that's going on politically against religion, against the word of God, the things that are being taught and undone. If they're so fast to undo our nation's history, some of it is black and it shouldn't have been done that way. But they're so fast to undo our history, it's nothing to undo God's history to make them fit their lifestyle today. <clears throat> when I said it's black, I mean it's dark, it's sinful, not the people. God looks at people with his eyes shut. Each and every one, no matter what color the person is, it's the soul that's important to God, not their skin color. And that's the way Christianity should be as well. We have to have faith in God, don't we? These people had to have faith in God. What are you talking about? 32,000 people or 100 people. It could have been a million people. But all it takes is one to make that difference. Just one person. We have to have that faith in God. In Judges chapter 7 and verse 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By three hundred men that lapped, I will save you. And deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. It's against man's odds, but it's not against God's odds. Another story that we can think about, about uh, one person making a difference, as I said, is David and Goliath. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 through 46, but I'm going to highlight a few verses for time's sake. 1 Samuel 17, 26 through 46. We'll start in verse 26. And David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Jump down to verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go and the Lord be with thee. As Christians, we got God on our side. We have his word to help guide us, instruct us. The whole armor of God is in this book that we can carry around, God's word. In verse 42 through 46, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he dismayed him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, little g. <clears throat> and the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me 
with the sword and the spear and with the shield. But I am come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee. Notice he gives the credit to God. Because <clears throat> what did he have? Oh, he had a measly little slingshot, didn't he, with five smooth stones up against a man who was uh, nine feet, six inches tall or thereabouts. He, he had a shield that was so heavy, he had a guy in front of him carrying the shield in front of him as protection. But David came alone with God. And this day will I deliver, or will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give thy carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and unto the beast of the earth, and all the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. For by one's actions, the people seen how powerful one little youth, ruddy, fair countenance child, as it may, stood up to a nine foot six man that the children of Israel were fearful of. It's not the quantity of people, however, it's the quality of worship according to God's word that God is looking for. We come together, we always try and teach that good message. The good news is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He came, he was the only begotten Son of God. Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He had to come because of the sin in life. In Romans chapter 3, 23 and 24, where all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's keep reading though. Let's not stick to one line. Let's keep reading. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through and in are very important words. Through the blood of Jesus had to be shed. But the important part about that shedding of his blood, everybody died on that cross of Calvary that went on it. But on the third day, Christ arose from that tomb. Without that resurrection of Jesus Christ, it would be vain for us to stand here this day. But I'm thankful that God had a plan that his son would be raised from the dead. The question is, are you in or out of Christ right now? Romans chapter 6, 3 through 7, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life, for if with we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism alone does not save you. Does not. You have to have faith in what you're believing. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have to be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have to be willing to repent. Turn away from that sin, that wrongdoing in your life. You're not, you cannot be unfaithful to your spouse and then say, well, I'm sorry, but yet still keep your girlfriend or boyfriend on the side. Have you repented? No, you have not. God expects the same thing. When you come to God, you're willing to confess that his son was the son of the living God. That he came and died on the cross of Calvary for all men. You need to repent. Turn away. Cut those sinful things off. Quit doing it, providing it, giving it, whatever it is. We have to quit doing that then you're immersed for the remission of your sins. In verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. 
For he that is dead is free from sin. There's no condemnation in Christ, or being in Christ either. In Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We have to do that continual walk. You can't just be baptized once done. Hey, where do I go now? You have to be in the mindset that you know you're a member of the Lord's church. You're to walk in the commandments that he has left for us. In 1 John chapter 1, 6-9 is the example given. For if we say that we have fellowship with him, God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to be willing, hey, I messed up, I've sinned. Repent of that sin, turn away from it. I want to leave you with this Old Testament story in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, 17 through 20. Same thing applies to those that were in the Old Testament as us today. Sin will separate you from God. They had rules to follow. We have rules to follow. But the heart has always been in man. And I want us to think about this. If man can train his tongue to lie, he can train his tongue to do anything else. He could also train his heart to be obedient to God. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 17, starting, But if thine heart turn away so that thou will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. Today we have denominations. We have different things in our lives that are temptations that we could worship to take us away from God. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish. And yet, and ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou possess, possess over Jordan to go possess it. I call in heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, and thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto the fathers, unto Abraham, Isaac, and unto Jacob to give them. We have to keep that in mind. We have a heaven that Christ said he was going to prepare for us this today. Our sin is what put Jesus on the cross, and Isaiah chapter 53 is a good reminder of that in Scripture. Today, if you have a need to respond to the invitation, we encourage you to do that. If you have sin in your life, make it right. If you need prayers of the congregation, let it be known. If you've never obeyed the gospel, please let us reach out today that we can help you.